Nell, I think we're about ready to rock and roll. You got it. Let's do it. Thank you, everybody, for joining the Crested Butte Mountain Heritage Museum and Dwayne Vandenbush for the 10th in our series about the history of the Crested Butte area. My name is Nell Paquette, and I'm the curator at the museum. And thank you to our state historian, as always, Dr. Dwayne Vandenbush. The museum recognizes that we are guests here on this land, historically Ute territory. We acknowledge that the Uncompahgre Ute and the Tabawatch Ute were forcibly removed from this area due to the Bruneau Treaty. We hope that you will take time to visit our neighbor, the Ute Museum, located in Montrose, Colorado, with exhibits developed in partnership with the Ute Tribes by History Colorado, our state historic society. While we can never do this history justice, we do include information about the Paleo Indians of the Gunnison Valley, the Ute people, the Bruneau Treaty, and the Los Pinos Indian Agency in our exhibits. <clears throat> We hope that you will consider becoming a member or making a donation to support this program and all the work we do at the museum. You can do that by visiting our website at christabutemuseum.com. We are wrapping up our walking tours for the season. I think we just have, I think we might have done the last of our walking tours, but we do have private walking tours available uh, at your convenience uh, for groups of three or more. This program is being recorded and will be available at crestbutemuseum.com or on our YouTube page. We are a little bit behind on posting last week's uh, video, uh, mostly because today would be usually the day that I loaded it and I got my vaccine yesterday. And so I've been out of the office most of the day resting. Um, so we, we will have last week's video up as soon as possible, as well as tonight's video and, and last night's flower shank video as well. So there'll be three whole new videos coming soon. Thank you to our lead sponsor, Western Colorado Alum University Alumni Relations, as well as Bluebird Realty and Bill Petros. Thank you so much for making this program possible. We'll have time for questions at the end of the talk. Please post them in the chat or in the Q&A. And finally, Dwayne, are we doing trivia tonight? We are. All right. It's all you. All right, thank you, Nell, and uh, thanks everybody for being on board. I want to remind everybody that it is Flowshink Week, and tomorrow from five to eight, uh, right outside of Cochevers on Elk Avenue, Lorenzo will be playing the accordion. We will be dancing the polka, and then they will be crowning the king and the queen. And then on Saturday, all the has-beens, the ex-kings and queens, are going to have a parade in uh, Crested Butte. So hope a lot of you folks can stop down outside of Cochevers. We will have a trivia question, and I'll ask that after I'm all finished with the uh, talk tonight, which is going to be on two towns that are very closely associated in a lot of ways with Crested Butte. One is Lake City, and the other is Aspen. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, and I'd also like to thank uh, Kevin Sanderford of Colorado Investments, who produces the book. He is the guy who pays for the book that we raffle off every week. This is session 10 of 12 tonight. Next week, we're gonna have a special presentation on one of the great unique towns in the United States and that's a great town of Marble, which has turned out the stone for the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument and many other buildings. I wanna tell all you people thanks. We've got 470 people registered for this class and nearly 200 are tuning in uh, almost every week. So here we go. And the topic tonight is the uh, uh, Lake City at Aspen. So here we go on Lake City. The year is 1873. Mining is uh, started in the San Juan. Miners have come in. And you're looking at Lake City right there in 1880 and 1881. And that became one of the great towns of the San Juan, along with Telluride and Uray and Silverton. And because so many miners were flocking in, the federal government had to sign a peace treaty or a treaty called the Bruno Treaty with the Ute Indians, which effectively moved the Ute Indians out of the San Juan. And that allowed people to come in. The following year in 1874, Otto Mears and Enos Hodgkiss we're building the Sawatch to San Juan toll road. It was running from a supply town called Sawatch and it was gonna go all the way to Silverton over Engineer Pass. And while they were building the road right where Lake City is today, the miners while digging uncovered gold. Many of them quit 
and began to locate some rich gold mines, and one of them was the Golden Fleece. The other guys who remained, along with Otto Mears and Ninas Hodgkiss, did finish that road, and they went over Engineer Pass at 12,856 feet and dropped down into the headwaters of the Animus in the great town of Silverton. Otto Mears would go on to become known as the Pathfinder of the San Juan, builder of many toll roads and railroads. Enos Hodgkiss had no desire to be a miner. He located in the North Fork Valley, became a very prominent cattleman and rancher, and today Hodgkiss, Colorado was named for him. So Lake City gets underway in 1874. There was an 88 mile wagon road that was built from the Richardson coal mine up Ohio Creek and went right into the Crook smelter, which was a big smelter just south of Lake City. And a guy named John Crook had that smelter and he had a lot of money then, but he made a lot mon more money later on when he invented tinfoil. Next uh, picture, Nell. Right outside of Lake City, there, there is Lake San Cristobal. And we'll keep that on for a moment. Because around the year 1270, according to geologists, because of leaching above, a whole bunch of dirt slid. And that was the famous slum gully and slide that roared down the mountainside, slammed into the Lake Fork of the Gunnison River, and dammed up Lake San Cristobal that you're looking at right now about 1884. And that is the second largest natural body, in body of water in Colorado, right behind that of Grand Lake. They called it Slumgullion because that yellow mass that roared down the mountainside reminded the miners of a type of soup that they had that had a yellowy appearance. Lake City was also the place where the famous incident of Alfred Packer unfolded. And here are some of the things that we know that are true about Alfred Packer. We know he was born in Pennsylvania in 1842, came out west 1862 after serving seven months in the Civil War and then being released because of epilepsy. He came into Colorado and was a jack whacker, drove jack trains around Georgetown and Central City. And in December of 1873, he was in Provo, Utah, and he convinced 20 other men to join him to follow to a great gold strike that was unfolding in Breckenridge in Colorado Territory. And he got them in January of 1874 over to Chief Uray's camp right near where Delta is today. And Chief Uray advised the men not to go any further because of the heavy snow that winter. However, Alfred Packer convinced five of the 20 men that he could find the way to Breckenridge. And on February the 9th, 1874, he and five others set out in a mounting snowstorm. 66 days went by until anybody saw Alfred Packer again. On April the 16th, 1874, he walked into the Los Pinos Indian Agency, not far from Cochito Pass in the Gunnison country, looking pretty good for a man who had been in the wilderness that long. Packer told Major Charles Adams in charge of the agency that they had gotten lost. Packer had gotten foot sore. The other five men went out to look for a trail. They never came back and Alfred Packer found his way to the Los Pinos Indian Agency. But he looked to be in pretty good health. And one of the Indians remarked to Major Charles Adams, him too damn fat. And Alfred Packer did look pretty good for a guy who'd been out in the boondocks for 66 days. He was found in many inconsistencies with his story. And he had a lot of money on him that it didn't look like somebody like him should have. So, he was lodged in the Sawatch jail that summer until they could find out maybe what happened. While Packer was in the Sawatch jail, in late August, a man named John Randolph sketching for Harper's Weekly, sketching a, a brand new booming mining camp of Lake City, was about on top of Cannibal Plateau, just above Lake San Cristobal. And there he found five decaying bodies. 
and bullet holes were found in the bodies and there were evidence of cannibalism. On that same day, coincident or not, Alfred Packer escaped from the Sawatch jail and he wasn't seen again for nine years. In 1883, one of the men who had been with Packer up in Provo, Utah and followed him down to Delta was at Fort Fetterman, Wyoming, when he walked into a bar and he saw a guy who was calling himself John Schwartz and he was peddling pots and pans. He recognized Alfred Packer, got word back to Lake City and Alfred Packer was returned to Hinsdale County for trial in 1883 at the age of 41. In court, he changed his story. He said the other five guys had gotten foot sore. He went out to try and find the trail. When he got back, one of the five men, Shannon Bell, had gone insane and killed four of the others. And Alfred Packer said in self-defense, he shot Shannon Bell. And he said, yes, I did engage in cannibalism because that's the only way I could stay alive. Alfred Packer was tried in the Hinsdale County Courthouse, which had been built in 1877, and he was convicted of five counts of murder and sentenced to hang. One of Packer's friends, Larry Dolan, a Sawatch bartender, was the first man uptown after the sentence was pronounced. And he told all the people in the bar that he ran into that Judge Melville Gary had pronounced sentence in the following way. And here's what Dolan said. Stand up, you voracious man-eating son of a blank. Stand up. There were seven Democrats in Hinsdale County and you ate five of them. Damn you. I sentence you to be hanged by the neck until you're dead as a warning against reducing the Democrat population in this state, in this, in this territory. Um, tell you right now that Hinsdale County has never voted Democratic in its history. There must be some Democrats afraid to go in to Hinsdale County after what the judge recounted in that Packer trial. Albert Packer, however, got lucky. He was uh, given a death sentence when Colorado was a territory. He had committed the crime in 1874. Colorado was a territory then. But when he was tried and convicted, there was no death sentence a little later on when Colorado became a state. And as a result, Packer had to be retried. And he was retried in 1883 because you can't, uh, because of ex post facto, you can't convict somebody of a crime and give them a death sentence when there was no death sentence when the crime was committed back in 1874. So Packer was tried again in 1883 in Gunnison. And this time, because of double jeopardy, he couldn't be tried for murder again. So this time he was tried and convicted on five counts of manslaughter and sentenced to eight years on each one of the five counts. Served 15 years at Canyon City. And then in 1901, a Denver Post reporter named Polly Pry got Alfred Packer released because she said he had been convicted on circumstantial evidence. And Alfred Packer was released and served and, and had the next six years of his life in Littleton, Colorado, died in 1907 and is buried there. He became famous as the Colorado cannibal. You can go to Boulder and on the CU campus, go in there to the Packer cafeteria and get yourself a Packer burger with a lot of relish and, and, and sauce and, and mustard and so on. Albert Packer, the incident of Albert Packer reminded me a lot of the great writer Robert Service, who wrote about the cremation of Sam McGee, when he said this, strange things are done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make their blood run cold. The Arctic lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was the night on the marge of old Lake Labarge, 
we cremated Sam McGee. Next photo, Nell. Lake City now got a newspaper. There is the Ute Ule mine located up Henson Creek. And they got a dam there to provide power. And there are two guys on a kayak and they're floating around in the 1930s. Lake City was located at 8,671 feet. By 1876, it had 2,500 people in town with one great mine after another with names like the Golden Fleece, the Hidden Treasure, the Black Wonder, and the Ute Ule. It was on the Barlow and Sanderson stage line run, and it was right on the edge of the great San Juan country. It became the county seat of Hinsdale County in 1875. George Hinsdale had been the Lieutenant Governor of Colorado Territory. The Lake City Silver World newspaper was started in 1875 and is still publishing today with Grant Houston as the editor and the owner. In 1876, two Presbyterian brothers named Alexander and George Darley built the Presbyterian Church, still stands, services today, the oldest church on the western slope of Colorado. The courthouse was built in 1877. That's where Alfred Packer was tried. George Darley would go on to write a book called Pioneering in the San Juan. And he talked about skiing over engineer cinnamon passes and going into Silverton and Animus Forks to bring the Bible to the miners. One time, a miner died of alcoholism, but Father Darley insisted that miners write to the family and say that he had died of pneumonia instead. By the early 1880s, Lake City was going downhill. It had low-grade ore. It was just on the edge of the San Juan. Didn't have that high-grade ore of Telluride, Silverton, and Uray. The railroad, which had graded in in 1881, was put on hold, and it wouldn't come in until 1889. And then, of course, a lot of snow, a lot of cold weather, and transportation very difficult. The great years of Lake City were 1874 to 1882. Winter sports were many, skating on Lake San Cristobal, sleighing and skiing. Miners on Engineer Pass skied down from there to the Frank Huff Mine to Rose's Cabin, three miles in 15 minutes. Target shooting, roller skating in the Opera House, drilling contests, baseball, Boxing and other activities came in Lake City. Next photo, Nell. There is the Ute Ule mine and one of the ore buckets. Next photo. There is the high bridge of the Denver and Rio Grande as it came into Lake City. Now that bridge is hundreds of feet high and a nine-year-old girl named Betty Steele from Lake City would, after the train went over the bridge, would walk along the tracks with a bucket of water and sand to make sure that cinders didn't catch the wood on fire. Later on, she married Frank Wallace, and her name became Betty Wallace, one of the greatest people I've ever met, my mentor, who wrote the original book on the Gunnison country. And I thought all kinds of titles for my book. And I finally went over to Betty and I said, Betty, would you mind if I use the words, the Gunnison country, like you did for your book? And she said, not at all. I've given a lot of eulogies in my life. And when I gave Betty's eulogy, I had a hard time finishing. Next photograph. There are the workers working on one of the bridges leading into Lake City. Next photograph. There is the Elk Creek Bridge, another high bridge that took you into Lake City. Next photograph. There are miners who worked at the Frank Huff Mine right outside of Rose's cabin. We'll get to that in a moment. And just under Engineer Pass. 
Next photograph. There is the contention mine. And that one is located right up Henson Creek, right outside of Lake San Cristobal. Next photograph. There he is. There's Alfred Packer, the Colorado cannibal. Next. And there is a guy in, uh, and his wife and sister in a uh, very, very early car, 1920, on the dirt roads outside of Lake City. Susan B. Anthony came into Lake City in the middle 1870s and gave two talks on behalf of women's rights. The Lake City Beer Garden opened up in 1878, one half mile up Henson Creek. Tables, benches, walks, and swings. Beer was served. Dances were held with great music and the old songs, Wait for the Wagon, When You and I Were Young Maggie, down by the old mill stream. In the 1880s, Henson Creek flooded and washed away much of the beer garden. Lake City had 29 saloons by 1877. A lot of gambling went on. Prostitution was common. Three boats took passengers on Lake San Cristobal for pay. And Lake City was the first town in the San Juan to have telephone service. In 1889, the Denver and Rio Grande narrow gauge arrived in Lake City. Now, from Lake City, two streams headed up to high passes. One of them is called Henson Creek. And you went to the town of Henson. Then you went to a town called Capital City. Then you went to a town called Rose's Cabin, where anybody going over Engineer Pass would stop for the night. They had a boarding house there. They had corrals for the horses. And then you went over Engineer Pass, and you dropped into the headwaters of the Animus, into the great town of Animus Forks, and then to Eureka and Howardsville and Silverton. Then the other way that you got out of Lake City was to go all the way to Lake San Cristobal and follow the Lake Fork of the Gunnison River. And that took you to a town called Carson, located four miles up Wager Gulch, and then to another town called Sherman, and then White Cross. And then you went over Cinnamon Pass at 12,600 uh, feet and dropped down again into Animus Forks. When you get to Animus Forks, the bottom of Engineer and Cinnamon Passes are within one mile of each other. Enough on Lake City. We now go to the great town of Aspen. And before we do it, we're gonna show some more photos of Lake City, so nail another one. There's Lake City in the 1880s, and as you're coming towards you, you're coming towards the great crook smelter. Next. There is the town of Henson, located right on Henson Creek, right as you leave Lake City and uh, head up towards Engineer Pass, 1880s. Next. There is the Elk Creek Bridge with a passenger train and uh, carrying some freight going over it, 1880, 1889. Next, there's the depot with the Rio Grande in front of it, narrow gauge. This is about the 1920s, next. There is the Lake San Cristobal Railroad. A guy by the name of Mike Burke ran the Ute mine. This was in the 1930s, and the railroad, the Rio Grande, had suspended operations because it wasn't much freight to carry. This is a Pierce Arrow automobile with an 80 horsepower Buick engine that pulled two or three cars behind it with the only available freight left. Maybe a little hay, maybe a little ore, maybe a couple of cows, and it operated for two years from 1934 to 1935. That thing would be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars today. Next. There's Lake City from a postcard taken from high above. 
and next. And there is the great flood in June of 1921. And there are one of the cabins going down the Lake Fork of the Gunnison River. And now the next slide will take us to Aspen and we're gonna talk about Aspen. So next photo, Nell. And there it is, the number one silver town in the world, 1887 the banks of the Roaring Fork River, the great town of Aspen. Before there was Aspen, there was a town called Ashcroft. Started in 1880, great mines with names like the Highland Mary and the Montezuma and the Tam O'Shanter. And the way that you got out of Ashcroft and over to Crested Butte, you kept right up, uh, right going up Castle Creek, crossed over Pearl Pass at 12,705 feet, came down Brush Creek, and then on into Aspen. There was another way into Aspen, and that was a tough one, and that was Independence Pass at 12,095 feet that brought you in from Leadville. The best mines, however, were not near Ashcroft. They were near Aspen. So Ashcroft lost the county seat in 1885. And by that year, only had 100 residents. In the 1930s, renewed interest as Ted Ryan and Billy Fisk came in. Billy Fisk was captain of the US Olympic bobsled team, which won the gold medal in 1932. These two men built the Highland Bavarian Lodge on Castle Creek and they planned a European style ski resort with an aerial tram that would take you up to Mount Hayden. Unfortunately, World War II came and Billy Fisk was killed flying for the RAF, first American killed in World War II, and that ended the dream. After the war, Stuart Mace, a World War II veteran, came to Ashcroft and established a dog sledding business. And he and his Huskies were featured in the TV series, Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. Stuart Mays devoted the rest of his life to protect that area from development. And today Ashcroft is on the National Register of Historic Places. Next uh, picture, Nell. There is Aspen and the main drag in the 1880s. Prospectors came into Aspen from Leadville over Independence Pass, from Gothic over East Maroon Pass, from Gothic over Brush Creek and then Pearl Pass. And there was a story about the optimism of the miners. I wanna tell, and they were very optimistic in those days. Story was told in many mining camps. Miner died, went to heaven. And everybody chuckled when they heard that in the mining camps because everybody knew no miner went to heaven. They were gambling, consorting with prostitutes and drinking, but this guy had been good. And he presented his pass to St. Peter at the Golden Gates. And St. Peter said, can't take you, we're booked. And the miner said, what the hell do you mean we're booked? And he said, I don't get on me. He said, we had a big religious war in the Middle East. A lot of good people died and we're booked. And the miner said, I did not abstain from all the pleasures of life to be told I can't get in. I want a temporary pass. And if I can go in and convince one person to come out, I'm in. St. Peter says, hasn't happened in hundreds of thousands of years. Nobody has ever arbitrarily left heaven. Miner said, shut up and give me the pass. And St. Peter felt bad about it knew nobody would leave and gave him the pass. Five minutes later, 4,618 people streamed out of heaven and they appeared to be in a fast hurry to leave. St. Peter said to the miner, what in the hell did you tell those people? And the miner said, what do you mean what did I tell them? I just told them it's a big gold strike down in hell. And then the miner grabbed his knapsack and he headed away from heaven. And by this time, St. Peter was hot and he grabbed the miner by the shoulder. He said, where the hell do you think you're going? And the miner said, what do you mean? Where do you think I'm going? 
Haven't you heard? They got a big gold strike down in hell. So the miner believed his own publicity. Great mountains surrounded Aspen, laden with silver ore. Aspen Mountain, Highland Peak, Smuggler, Richmond, and Red Mountain all had silver. The Molly Gibson mine had a silver vein that turned out 3,300 ounces of ton of silver to the ton when silver was selling at a buck an ounce. Today it's selling at 19 an ounce. All of the mining at Aspen was load mining or hard rock mining, which meant you had to go deep into the ground to build to bring the silver up. And then you had to smelt it when it got to the top. And they used to say that good gold and silver is about $200 to the ton. And what they meant by that was you would bring one ton of muck and debris and rocks up. And somewhere in that one ton was 10 ounces of gold, which sold at 20 an ounce, that means 200 of the ton, or that amount of silver or more, which would mean $200 of silver to the ton. And it was difficult to get that stuff out. The smuggler mine in Aspen produced a 2,060 pound nugget, 93% pure silver. Aspen was located where five streams kind of come to, came together. Roaring Fork River, Castle Creek, Maroon Creek, Hunter Creek, and Woody Creek. B. Clark Wheeler came into Aspen in 1880, started the Aspen Times. Jerome Wheeler came into Aspen and built the Wheeler Opera House for $125,000 and the Hotel Jerome for $125,000, both built in 1889 and named for him. Roads into Aspen were terrible. Whether you're coming in over Taylor, Pearl, East or West Maroon, or Independence Pass, which was the worst. The Aspen Times of May 1885 said this, and I'm quoting, Three jacks and a jack train coming over the range yesterday fell in the mud and were trampled out of sight by the rest of the train. What kind of condition must Independence Pass Road be when this is the case? Well, the answer is not very good. Next picture. This is the picture of Ashcroft after the great days were over. Next photograph. This is the rust sampler, sampling ore with the Rio Grande Railroad right out in front of it in the 1890s. On March the 10th, 1884, five men living in one cabin up Conundrum Creek, not far from Aspen, were buried under 25 feet of snow in a roaring avalanche. The dead were brought into Aspen by sled. 33 days later, a group of Aspen men went back to retrieve the dead men's belongings as the snow had melted, and they found Bruiser, a bulldog who had been buried and was barely alive. Bruiser recovered and lived the rest of his life with the wife of one of the dead miners. Isolation before railroads meant that the only way you got ore out of Aspen was to put 200 pounds on the back of a burrow and have 500 to 1,000 burrows going up East Maroon Creek, topping out over the pass at 11.8, down Copper Creek, into Gothic, and then to the railhead at Crested Butte. And then you'd load those burrows up with 200 pounds of supplies and take it back into Aspen. The Denver and Rio Grande Railroad arrived in Aspen in November of 1887, about seven years after the great town had been producing ore, narrow gauge over Tennessee Pass. A toast was given as the Rio Grande arrived by the mayor of Aspen who said, here's to our Aspen, her youth and her age. We welcome the railroad, say farewell to the stage. And whatever her lot, 
and wherever we be, here's God bless forever, the DNRG. Three months later, February 1888, the Colorado Midland Broad Gauge Railroad arrived, going through the Hagerman Tunnel and down the Frying Pan River into Basalt, and then they ran a extension on into Aspen. It was the first broad gauge railroad over the Continental Divide in Colorado. From 1882 to 1892, Aspen was the number one silver camp in the world, turning out $100 million worth of silver at a dollar an ounce. Today, ladies and gentlemen, it's $19 an ounce. So by today's prices, in that 10 year period, Aspen turned out almost $2 billion of silver. The town had 11,000 people, 10 daily passenger trains, six newspapers, 40 saloons, with ladies of the evening with names like Two Bit Lil, Token Tessie, and Poker Alice, had one of the great red light districts in Colorado. And then came the silver panic of 1893. Price of silver fell to 58 cents. Mines shut down. Investors stopped coming in. Railroads stopped running. And silver was done forever. The population in Aspen fell to 700. And Aspen languished for many years, all the way through the Great Depression of the 1930s. Next photo, Nell. There is Aspen when the good days are kind of all gone. You could have shot a cannonball down the main drag and not hit anybody. In 1938, they built a boat tow, run off a car wheel and a car engine. And that boat took 700 people 500 yards up to the side of Ajax or Aspen Mountain. The Red Onion opened up in 1892 in Aspen as the Brick Saloon. It was a place for working men. After World War II, one of the members of the 10th Mountain Ski Division, Johnny Litchfield bought it and gave it the new name of the Red Onion. And it became the place to be in Aspen with a skier special you could buy for a buck and a quarter. Andre Roach, was the man who saw the possibility of skiing on Aspen or Ajax Mountain. And there's a great run name for him today. Of course, Ted Ryan and Billy Fisk had also foreseen the day where you might be able to ski on Mount Hayden. After the war came Walter Pepke, the head of the American Can Corporation and his wife Elizabeth into Aspen. And Pepke and Friedel Pfeiffer, started the Aspen Ski Corporation, 1947, and put in chair one. And chair one had a blanket over your legs, and it was a one-man chair, and Aspen was on its way. Elizabeth Pepke started the Aspen Institute, which still brings in top people today. Albert Schweitzer, Adley Stevenson ran twice against Dwight Eisenhower, and many top world figures still come there to the Aspen Institute today. Next picture. There's the Hotel Jerome. Not long after it was built, probably around the turn of the century. The FIS ski championships were held in Aspen in 1951. And Aspen was now on its way to becoming one of the great ski areas in the nation. Many of the 10th Mountain Ski Division men came into Aspen to help build that area up. They had come into Aspen in the early days whenever they got a furlough from Camp Hale off Tennessee Pass, where they trained. And they slept on the floor of the Hotel Jerome. And to stay warm, they drank the most famous of all drinks, five shots of bourbon in a thick chocolate mall shake called Aspen Crud. And they said they never got cold after they drank that. And they also had a great song they sang. Their systems and theories of skiing are one thing I surely have found. 
Skiing's just good in the winter, but drinking's good all year around. Four areas soon came in Aspen. Aspen Mountain, Aspen Highlands with Whip Jones, Snowmass in the 1960s, and Buttermilk. Today, the great town is a town of 5,000, one of the ski capitals of the world, with a renovated Hotel Jerome and Wheeler Opera House. And when you go into Sardi Field, the airport, you can see one Learjet after another. John Denver wrote many of his songs while in Aspen. Starwood at Aspen. Sunshine on my shoulders makes me happy. Rocky Mountain High. And the famous Hunter Thompson lived nearby at Woody Creek. And wrote all kinds of great books on his own. So there are the two great towns, Lake City and Aspen, satellite towns to Crested Butte in the early days. And now Nell, we're gonna put another picture up. There's Aspen in the 1930s, another one, another photo. There's Aspen in the 1930s. And I think we got one more. And there is the Roach Run in the 1940s. Nell is now going to come on board. And we are now going to have the trivia question. And Nell will tell you how to answer. All right. As usual, to win trivia, the first person to answer correctly in the chat uh, and that we see on our side, we will email you to get your mailing address so Dwayne can shoot you off your prize as quickly as possible. All right, here is the question. I want to name, either name, the two high passes that separate Lake City from Silverton and one of the passes that separate Lake City from Creed. We await the answers. Ooh, Mark Ellis with Engineer and Cimarron. He's got Engineer Cinnamon and Slumgullion. Emily Rutherford, I think, got it. Emily Rutherford, all right. We'll get her, we'll get her address. A lot of people chiming in now, but I think Emily was first. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can go to the chat board and any questions that you have, I will attempt to answer. So uh, just go ahead and get the chat board. If there are any questions, Nell will give them to me. Great to have everybody on board. Uh, well, or if you just want to chat. Yeah, if you just want to chat, say hello. And if, while everybody's getting their questions organized, uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors one more time, Western Colorado University Alumni Relations, uh, Bluebird Realty, and Bill Petros. Thanks for making this happen. Emily, congratulations on winning the Crested Butte book. I'll be sending it out to you as soon as I get your address. Any questions that anybody has on the talk tonight? Anybody want to chat on the talk tonight? What is a jack train? A jack train is made up of burrows, which were jackasses, and uh, they emitted a shrill whistle if they were overloaded. So a jack train means you got 500 or 1,000 burrows coming into Crested Butte with all that Aspen ore until the railroad came in. Any active silver mines, Annie Clausen says no. Silver is pretty much done. Bill Grierson has a, a copy of the history of the hide off from uh, Betty. What make model of the automobile in Lake City made into a rail car? That was a Pierce Aero automobile with an 80 horsepower Buick engine. Any other questions? Can you talk about the time that Texas tried to turn Lake City <laughs> into a Texas state? Well, I don't know if they were trying to turn Lake City in, but in 1936, the early maps showed that there was a, a thin strip of territory that ran out of Texas through Colorado, and it included Breckenridge. 
and Governor Ed Johnson formally took possession of that for Colorado in 1936. So Aspen had a claim on the early maps to that area. What happened to the Pierce Arrow engine? I wish I knew. I have no idea, unfortunately. I'm on the lookout though. Was the Galloping Goose a type of car or just a train engine? The Galloping Goose was a car with wheels that were fitted to the tracks, but the wheels never fit very well on the tracks. So the left wheel would hit the left rail and ricochet to the right wheel hitting the right rail and ricochet, ricochet, and the thing went down the track like a galloping goose because the axles never fit quite well on the railroad tracks. But it was a automobile frame with an 80 horsepower Pierce Air, uh, 80 horsepower Buick engine pulling cars. Any other questions? Are any of the wooden train buildings still standing? No, but the uh, high bridge, you can go to the community church in Gunnison and that, they're there. That's what they used to build the community church. Any other questions? Did you ever meet Peter Jenkins, the author that wrote about staying in Lake City in the 1970s? I did not. No, I did not. Uh, last week, you spoke about the KKK in Colorado and many politicians that belong to that group. Looking for an update on that topic. Yeah, you know, we're going to do that for History Colorado in late April on the KKK. Ben Stapleton, member of the Klan. Governor John Locke, member of the Klan. Most of the state legislators, member of the Klan. Western State College president, member of the Klan. And this is no disrespect to Colorado or the Gunnison country because in the 1920s, if you weren't a member of the Ku Klux Klan, you couldn't have been elected dog catcher. I find Did Ashcroft have a lift? No. You walked up uh, or a guy by the name of uh, Taggart, Billy Taggart took you up in a sled with horses. Uh, from and that's Kara, why they call it the Taggart hut today. From Kara, I have, I find it curious that the mines used mules, but burrows were used for hauling stuff back and forth from Crested Butte to Aspen. Why the different animals for those purposes? Well, they, they used that, used burrows instead of mules because it was only a trail at that time, and you couldn't get a four mule wagon over the pass, and especially in the wintertime. So mules were not, used, they were using the coal mines, and later they were used when you had roads, but not when you just had a trail. Wasn't it Professor Edmondson who had the idea to name the student grill at Western the Alfred Packer Grill, then a student of his transferred to see you and took the idea with him and got it done? Yes, and Bill Edmondson was a great friend of mine. Uh, we were all over the place and he did have that idea. And I'll tell you a funny story. We had many tours and uh, we'd take classes out. And Edmondson told me one time, if I can use a bad expression, he says, God damn it, Bannon Bush, I spent more time in motel rooms with you than I have with my wife. <laughs> That's how many hotel rooms we were in together on our tours. A question about Crested Butte. What was the relationship between the old timers, miners, for example, who remained in Crested Butte after the big mine closed and the people who came to Crested Butte after that? For example, people who came for recreation or other reasons. Yeah, well, it took a while for the, both groups to get to tolerate each other. George Sibley, of course, talks about that all the time. Uh, the older people thought that all these people who came in with recreation, that wasn't a real job. Coal mining was a real job. But eventually, the miners and the people who came later on got to know each other pretty well and mixed and everybody got along, but it took a while. Any more stories about Betty Wallace? 
Well, Betty Wallace taught Spanish at the high at the Gunnison High School. And I had four boys from Venezuela on my track team, all great runners. Uh, Eduardo Navas, Franco Rapazo, Juan Diaz, and Jose Rojas. And Betty Wallace was their mother while they were here. And when she passed away, they were heartbroken that they couldn't come for the funeral. Betty Wallace was one of the greatest people that I ever met. And on my scale from one to 10, there have only been very few 11s, but she was an 11. And when I gave, she just did so much for the Gunnison country. She worked for the newspapers. She wrote a great book called History with the Hide Off. She wrote one called The Gunnison Country. She wrote another one called Epitaph for an Editor. One of the great people. Uh, when is the Colorado history class with the KKK? The Colorado history class is going to be taught this fall. And I will uh, talk with Nell and Ashley and uh, the new people coming into the museum. But my scheduled date for that is starting in September. 12 sessions. Who owns the Hotel Jerome in Wheeler Opera House? You know, I don't know who owns it right now. I think it's a corporation. Uh, they put $5 million into the restoration of the Hotel Jerome and about the same in the Wheeler Opera House. And I think they're both owned by corporations. Are there any active silver mines? No. And very few gold mines except at Cripple Creek. Mm -hmm. They're still turning out $400 million a year in gold. Uh, not much mention of gold in Aspen? No, there wasn't much gold in Aspen or the Gunnison country. You know, a little bit of a byproduct when they produce silver, but not enough to really open up any gold mines. All right. If you've got any last questions, post them in there. What's our topic next week, Dwayne? Next topic next week is going to be the great town of Marble one of the most unique towns in America. Lisa Hall says, do people ever try to get into the mines? Not if they are smart, because they're very dangerous. Uh, Annie Clausen has more about Burroughs, please. Let me give you a great book, uh, Annie, that is one of the best I've ever written. P. David Smith, On the Backs of Burroughs, one of the top books I've ever read. P. David Smith on the backs of burrows. I'll tell you everything you want to know about that animal, which was absolutely indispensable to the success of mining in the West. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Great to have you on board. Doug, oh, here's Doug in. Uh, Wheeler Opera is owned by Aspen, and the Hotel Jerome is owned by Auburg. Thank you, Doug. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. And thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, Nell. We'll see you next week. You bet. See you at the polka party for Flashing. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for being on tonight. Hope to see you all next week. All right. Good night. Nell, yeah, Nell, before you get off, uh, th thanks, Doug. How many did we have on tonight watching? Uh, we had over 120 this evening. Oh, that's great. OK, yeah. good deal. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Thanks, Jim. Great to have you guys on board. Thanks, Megan. We will. We'll dance for you. Wish you could be there. All right, folks, Vanderbush signing off. Over and out.